Good morning. Good morning. It's good to see all of you all this morning. Um, I have to say that I almost chose to preach on Luke chapter 13 this morning because one of the one of the sentences in that verse talks about Jesus wishing he could gather the people under uh, under him like a chicken gathers her chicks under a wing. And it reminds me, or makes me think of one of my favorite singers, Johnny Cash. And uh, Johnny Cash's best work happens at the end of his life with a series of American recording albums. And uh, American Recordings 4, he sings a song called The Man Comes Around. And every line in that song is straight out of the Bible. And uh, Cash was recording it almost on his deathbed. They literally had to stop so he could rest between takes. So um, this has nothing to do with my sermon this morning, but (laughs) this week, go listen to some Johnny Cash. Uh, This morning, we are going to be in Genesis chapter 15, uh, verses 1 through 12 and 17 through 18. Uh, And you can read along in the the Bible in the pew in front of you if you'd like, or on the screen. After these things, the word of the Lord came to Abram in a vision. Do not be afraid, Abram, I am your shield. Your reward shall be very great. But Abram said, O Lord God, what will you give me? For I continue childless, and the heir of my house is Eliezer of Damascus. And Abram said, You have given me no offspring, and so a slave born in my house is to be my heir. But the word of the Lord came to him, This man shall not be your heir, but uh, no one but your very own issue shall be your heir. He brought him outside and said, Look toward the heavens and count the stars, if you are able to count them. Then he said to him, So shall your descendants be. And he believed the Lord, and the Lord reckoned it to him as righteousness. Then he said to him, I am the Lord who brought you from Ur of the Chaldeans to give you this land to possess. But he said, O Lord God, how am I to know that I shall possess it? He said to him, Bring me a heifer three years old, a female goat three years old, a ram three years old, a turtle dove, and a young pigeon. He brought him all these and cut them in half, in two, laying each half against the, over against the other. But he did not cut the birds in two. And when birds of prey came down on the carcasses, Abram drove them away. As the sun was going down, a deep sleep fell upon Abram, and a deep and terrifying darkness descended upon him. When the sun had gone down and it was dark, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch passed between these pieces. On that day, the Lord made a covenant with Abram, saying, To your descendants, I give this land from the river of Egypt to the great river, the river Euphrates. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for this day. We're, we're so thankful for uh, your day uh, on Sunday when we can come together and worship you and be encouraged by one another, and be challenged by one another. And This morning, Lord, as we dwell uh, in your word, we ask for words of strength and comfort, but also words that um, help us grow into the kind of people you want us to be. And it's your son's name, I pray. Amen. <clears throat> well, I wish faith was something that came easy to me. But the truth is, that hard questions and doubt have always been a constant companion with me in my search for a deeper faith. One place that has always helped me, though, is church. I've always found that when I'm worshiping alongside other people, when I'm serving alongside my sisters and brothers in Christ, my faith in God feels more concrete. It begins to feel more real. And I especially love a cappella singing. And I, I don't mean that in a sectarian or legalistic way. I think musical instruments and church services, they're fine. But a cappella singing is one of the best parts of our tradition. A cappella singing, singing without instruments, singing with four part harmony, is one of the treasures that churches of Christ bring to the great table of Christianity. I think about uh, times when I've spent working abroad, when I lived in Thailand, and we would go somewhere, and our church, little church would get together in a market and begin singing, and the way people would come together. This week, 
I was writing about um, an earthquake that struck Japan in 1923. It's the Great Kanto earthquake. It was the worst natural disaster since the fires that burned London down in 1666. And right after the earthquake, a group of Churches of Christ missionaries came together to kind of the central park of Tokyo uh, to give out aid. And the way that they drew people to them was to uh, uh, an American woman, a Japanese wo woman, and two Japanese preachers. They started singing four-part harmony together. And these crowds came together. It's, a, it's just a beautiful part of our tradition. I love that we join our voices together to make beautiful music. The singing, it joins us together. It orients us, directs us to focus on God, and it helps me with my faith. But sometimes the songs we sing, they're not the best. The messages and the lyrics give us distorted ideas of who God is or what our faith ought to look like. And some of these songs are very popular. I really like some of these songs a lot. And uh, this morning I brought a, uh, a visual aid with me. Uh, I don't know if you are familiar with this book. It comes in maroon, since I'm an Aggie, green, blue, and yellow. I know you might be familiar with 728B, <laughs> Our God, He is Alive. This is the Church of Christ, and, and I love this book. There are so many songs that encourage me in this book, but there's a song in here, and of course, this song appears in other songbooks as well, uh, called Oh for a Faith That Will Not Shrink. Now, are you familiar with this song? Do you remember the tune? Oh, for a faith that will not shrink, though pressed by every foe, that will not tremble on the brink of any earthly woe that will not murmur or complain beneath the chastening rod, but in the hour of grief or pain will lean upon its God. A faith that shines more bright and clear when tempests rage without, that when in dark danger knows no fear, in darkness feels no doubt. Lord, give us such a faith as this, and then whate'er may come, we'll taste and hear the hallowed bliss of an eternal home. What a song. What a triumphalist, upbeat tune. Da, 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 da. Oh, to have a faith like that. I have prayed so many times. Again and again, when I've sung this song in church. The message it gives us is very clear. Good faith, the ideal faith, true faith, is free from all doubt and fear. And let me be clear. I'm not saying that that is bad faith. In fact, in 1 Corinthians chapter 12, Paul gives us a list of spiritual gifts, and one of those gifts is faith. It is a gift that God gives to people in the church to strengthen the community, but it's not a gift that God gives to everybody. And I don't necessarily know if it's a gift I have or not, but I wish I did. So please don't hear me say that if your faith is strong and free from fear or doubt, fear or doubt that it's, there's something wrong with it. That is not what I'm saying. But when I sing these words, when I reflect on my life, I fail again and again to measure up to the kind of faith that's in this song. I doubt, I question, I fear, I murmur, and I complain. Having a super faith like this sounds nice, but the truth is that it does not match up with the realities of our lives. It doesn't feel like it's realistic. It doesn't address the wilderness of trial and temptation that we live in. More importantly, applying this faith to everybody doesn't feel like it's biblical. When we look at lives of the heroes of faith that we celebrate in the Bible, we don't find the kind of people described in that song. Instead, we find people like us, people who struggle, who doubt, who mess up, who question and wrestle with God. And who better to talk about that than one of the greats, Abraham, or in the case of our text today, Abram. And you, you all know this story. You know this story really well. It's pretty straightforward. God promises, Abram believes. God commands, Abram obeys. Abram left his country and his father's house in response to God's command, go. 
and God's promises of blessing and prosperity. Abraham left and he didn't ask any questions. Famine forced him down to Egypt. And after a few adventures, that's probably a nice way to put it. He prospered there and left rich in cattle, silver, and gold. He went back to Bethel and gave his nephew Lot first choice of the land to settle. And at this point, God made another promise to Abram. Walk through the land and I will give it to you. Abram obeyed. Later, he rescued Lot, who had become a prisoner of war. Then returning from victory, Abram gave Melchizedek, Melchizedek, the great high priest of God of Salem, a tithe or a large percentage of all the men and goods he had captured. And in response, Melchizedek declared, Blessed be Abram by God most high, maker of heaven and earth. Does all of this sound familiar to you? Do you know the story? Abram seems bold. He's courageous, obedient, humble, and faithful in everything he does. Lord, give us such a faith as this, and then whatever may come, we'll taste in here a hallowed bliss of an eternal home. Ooh, Abram. That's usually where we stop with him. This is the part of the story we emphasize. But in our text this morning, there comes a point. In spite of everything, plenty of possessions and wealth, new land to settle in, and victory over his family's enemies, there comes a point when Abram finally says, wait one minute, I have a question. And if you're like me, you might be breathing a sigh of relief right now. Abram, the great model of faithfulness, is also a person who wants to know how God is going to fulfill God's promises. Abram, his name means mighty father. But at this point in the story, he has no children. At the beginning of Genesis, God creates a creation that keeps creating itself. But Sarai, Abram's wife, is the first barren person in the Bible. In Genesis 12, 13, and 14, God makes Abram and Sarai a series of blessings. But in chapter 15, the promises still have not been fulfilled. And in the face of all of this, Abram says, I'm not absolutely sure. I still have questions. And, he, and as he begins to ask his questions, some of them also begin to sound a little bit like complaining. Are you going to give me what I really want, God? Is a slave going to be my heir? I want a legitimate son. Can a person who questions and complains also be a model of faith? What does it mean to be faithful? What is a character of faithfulness? So often we face perplexing questions when we feel the anxiety of doubt and, the un and uncertainty, when we struggle with frustration and disappointment, we think of it as a crisis of faith. Too often, the sermons we hear, the songs we sing, the words we use to try to comfort each other tempt us to think of faith only as unquestioning acceptance or silent submission. But when we follow Abram on his journey of faith, he clearly comes to a point where he challenges and questions God's claims. I will bless you, God says to Abram. What can you give me? I want nothing but an heir, Abram responds. How exactly is that going to happen when I am old and childless? This conversation that Abram has with God, especially his response, follows the pattern of a lament. We often see those in the Old Testament. There's even an Old Testament book called Lamentations. And in the Old Testament, when a person <clears throat> makes a lament, they're not simply angry or sad or weeping. They're in deep pain. They're in deep anguish and suffering. When a person is lamenting, they complain to God and name this pain in God's presence. It is a kind of prayer because in naming your pain, complaining to God, you make your problem God's problem. You ask God, what are you going to do about this? 
Do you see faithfulness in this response? When Abram questions God's activity, Abram is taking God seriously. When Abram questions God, he believes in God's presence. He believes that God has the power to do something about it. When we question God, it's not a sign of doubt or unfaithfulness. It demonstrates our belief that God is listening. That God has the power to do something about it. And this is part of the promise of prayer for you and for me. God is open to us bringing our complaints, our pain and anguish to God in prayer. God is open to us asking, God, what are you going to do about this? God asks us to make our problems God's problems. But this does lead us to another question. What next? What happens next for us? What happens next for Abram in the text? Well, God reaffirms and expands the promise. Look toward heaven and count the stars if you can count them. So shall be your descendants. And Abram, he makes a choice at this point. Though the promises are yet to be fulfilled, though he does not know exactly how God will make this happen, Abram makes the choice to believe. Abram's faithfulness is a questioning faithfulness, a pleading with God for more, more information, more clarity, more courage, more commitment, as we stumble along trying to follow the steps God has called us to make on our journey of faith. And God always responds in faithfulness. At the end of the text, and you might have noticed it, this curious ritual takes place. God makes a covenant with Abram. In the ancient Near East, when two parties would make an important promise to each other, they would take several animals, cut them in half, lay them out, and walk between them together. This actually happens uh, in the book of Jeremiah, and it doesn't go well for the people who make the covenant. And the whole idea when you do this is that if one of the people making the covenant broke it, they're saying, then let it be to me as the animals we slaughtered today. Kill me, cut me in half. The stakes are high for the people making the covenant. But look at the text. Who makes the covenant? Abram falls asleep. And representing God, a smoking fire pot and a flaming torch pass between the pieces alone. God makes the covenant alone. It doesn't matter what Abram does in the future. Nothing Abram can do is going to affect God's promise to fulfill that covenant. God in that moment is saying it all depends on God to fulfill the promise. God pledges God's very life to make good on the promise. If I fail to keep this promise, let me be slain just as the goat, the sheep, and the ram were slain. God is always faithful, no matter what. Like Abram, we have questions that will not be silenced as we walk in faithfulness to God. Like Abram, we can question God as part of our faithfulness and trust, but like Abram, we can also make the choice to believe. A questioning faith doesn't just end with questions. It requires a response as well. A questioning faith takes God's power and presence in our lives seriously, but it also challenges us to be open to God's work in our lives. It challenges us to remember what God has done in our past and pushes us to look forward to what God can do in our future. Abram chose to believe that we can make the cho that choice too. We can live expectantly that God's promises of life, hope, and future are extended in Jesus Christ, who defines faithfulness by the character of his own life and death, and who calls us to take the next step to follow him. So I began this morning talking about how the songs we sing sometimes misrepresent how we ought to think about the life of faith. There are, however, songs we sing that are much better. And one in particular that I grew up singing, it's also in this wonderful book, uh, comes straight out of Scripture. 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 12. It's called, I know whom I have believed. 
I like this psalm because it leaves a little more room for a kind of questioning faith and the choice to believe. And here's the first verse. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me he hath made known, nor why unworthy Christ in love redeemed me for his own, but I know whom I have believed, and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. There's a lot in this world that we just don't know. And it's hard to say how God works in this world and how God works in our lives. But during this season of Lent, as we wander through the wilderness of life, being tempted and tested like Jesus was for 40 days, let's bring God along with us on that journey. When 50 Muslims are gunned down during a prayer service by a terrorist, when airplanes fall out of the sky, and when God's creation seems to lie in ruin around us, let's complain about it. Well, we don't know where our next meal is coming from when we get the worst possible news from the doctor, when all of our relationships with the people closest to us seem utterly broken. Let's ask God some questions. Let's talk to God about it. Let's ask God what God will do about it. And let's remember that God is always faithful. Let's remember what God has done for us in the past. Let's remember that God is here with us in the present. And let's remember that God walks with us into the future. And so now there's another prayer I want to pray with another song that we sing. I know the one in whom I have put my trust, and I am sure that he is able to guard until that day what I have entrusted to him. Let's pray together. Dear Lord, thank you for your word. Thank you for these stories of faithfulness and stories of people who are just like us, who struggle, who question, who doubt. And we thank you for the way that you work in their lives and engage them and take them seriously. And God, I also, I want to be like them. I want to believe, but please, Lord, help my unbelief. Help me to take you seriously in this world and help me to make the choice to believe. And it's your son's name I pray. Amen.